Anyone need a Understood. tissue? <laughs> I think we have people, um, people with some tissue boxes going around. Um, Milo, I want to start with you. Um, yep. What was your first reaction when you read this script? And did you immediately go buy stock in Kleenex? Uh, no, I didn't buy stock <laughs> in Kleenex. But my first reaction from the script, honestly, was thank God that there's still material out there that is so simple and tells a story of us and, and the bravery of, of uh network to be able to do that and attracting amazingly talented folks like Ken and everyone else on board. I mean, you know, I, I've been doing this a long time and I've seen a lot of great scripts and I've seen a lot of bad scripts, but it was one of those things that I thought, how wonderful at this time in our world's life um, to have a story that is so simply familiar and, and uh, as Dan Fogelman likes to say and remind us, inherently good. And, and promoting that goodness. So for me, it was just, I, uh, I'm happy to be here. Did you immediately connect with Jack, or did you think, uh, or were you like, I just want to be a part of this, I would well, play I, any character? At first, I was like, wait, should I be Kevin? Because, like, I'm an actor. But, but that's the thing, because, like, I'm an actor. Yeah, exactly, because I'm an actor. I'm thinking, well, maybe not. I'll be, I'll be the actor. But then, um, you know, I'd been a huge fan of... Uh, of not only Dan Fogelman, but John Roquois and Glenn Ficarra and those guys, and I knew that what the three of them had done together, and um, and I just I I believed in what they believed in me, um, and so so when I, when I dove into to Jack, I found this instant connection to a man that felt incredibly familiar, even though I don't have kids, and and it just it just felt right, and 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 what I've found in you know the collaboration like with with directors and producers like Ken or John and Glenn or just, you know, staring eye in eye with Mandy because um, she's tall. It's, <laughs> it was, it was, it, it, it just felt right. It just feels real and it feels very natural. In a show full of twists, what's been the scene that's made you cry the most? I mean, look, there, there are a million moments. I don't find myself crying for Jack. And I don't know if you guys have noticed, but Jack is a pretty stoic character. Tears don't really fall for Jack. That's not Jack. He may lead with his heart, but he's got to be the patriarch of this family. So, you know, where, where you get that beautiful single tear out of, out of uh, Sterling's Randall or, you know, Mandy's crying or Chris, any of them, it's like Jack doesn't cry. So for me, it's a lot of stuff that, you know, like it, it absolutely crushed me for a few days, uh, William's passing. You know, Ron, I mean, my God, what a deep, beautiful, soul, soulful actor that man is. Um, <laughs> You know, when, when, when Chrissy is, is at the, uh, um, the weight camp and she's going through the drum circle and she has that moment of breaking with, with you know, things that have happened in her life, you know, things like that make me cry or, or you know, Randall's stuff and Kevin's stuff too. I mean, Kevin, God, I feel like we barely scratched the surface of Kevin. I'm so excited. Yeah. And you, you with your, you know, adorable adopted son is just such oh, yeah. a... Right now, I did see his tears well up a little bit with the scene with his son. So I think that's just so poignant. Yeah, it is. It is. There. Uh, yeah, I will cry for Jack. Jack stuff too. Yeah. Um, what's been your favorite scene to film? From what's the, the new season? favorite scene to film? Yeah. Your favorite. your favorite scene to film. Oh, what's been my favorite scene to film? It's like asking you, like, what your favorite kid is, and you're like, <laughs> you're like, you know, Tom Thumb, like Family of Twelve, man. You know, to be really honest, I mean, one of the, I think one of the best scenes, one of the best moments, one of the highlights of my 22 years as an actor, as a career, was working on that very last episode with Ken and getting to film this fight that I feel like we've all had with our partners um, where you're just, you're not even, you're fighting to be heard and you're fighting for your point of view at the same time, you're catching these things that your partner's saying, and you're just like in, like in disbelief to it, you know. So that that big argument that Mandy and I had in that 18th episode, leading up to the very end, which you know this beautiful poetic tie everything together. I mean that that had to be one of the most satisfying things. Yeah, you were incredible on set. In that. Yeah, Ken, talk to us yeah. about um, filming that scene. Um, this was the scene that was at the in the last episode where. Uh, Dan Fogelman wanted to do a scene um, without edits. Um, I think his feeling was to, to capture that rawness of a fight, especially a domestic fight between two people that really love each other. Um, he wanted to do it without, without cutting. And so we had talked about, it was gonna be a, a, you know, a pretty long scene, 
Um, yeah, Milo it, was like, it was like a six, six or seven page scene, which, yeah. you know, with edits can, you know, take up some time, but in a yeah. one or. I mean, we, you know, we, with Mandy and Milo, you have two actors that come prepared to work and can sustain their performance over that much time. Uh, you know, often you find actors get used to doing film or television and to do a sustained take like that is, is really difficult, but they, they were both ready. We rehearsed it the day before so that the cinematographer could map out how we were gonna shoot it. And uh, we staged it then and we came in in the morning. I mean, it's hard to have a, a knockdown drag out fight with your spouse at 7.30 in the morning. But you know, I mean, yeah. you know, I've been married a long time so I kinda know what that's about, but. <laughs> But also, Milo like, and Mandy, not so much. Um, well, I think there were things that I even said to Mandy, like takes that didn't quite make what the picture <laughs> was. That I think Mandy's never heard anyone say to her before. Like, That's I promise not true. You. She was giving it back to you. I think for her, it was a real, you know, oh, real it was catharsis. A release. I mean, look, she man, was really like. I mean, a couple of takes were real, like X-rated. They were. Just, the Mandy Moore is the nicest like, human you know, being on the planet, but yeah, she was able to say things to me that I don't think she's ever said to anybody before. <laughs> But, but also, I want to say, Ken had orchestrated this beautiful, beautiful shot that was very much giving each character their, their valued space. And it's very difficult to do that when there's so much at stake for, for, for both characters, for Jack and for Rebecca. And, and it's, it was such a delicate balance, and it, it literally was all hands on deck. I, I mean... You know, I think one of the things you know, that I'm thinking about it now that's, I think it's one of the things about that scene, whether that scene, you know, if, how that scene affected different people, but I think the thing that, and I know Dan Fogelman was really proud of that scene yeah. as much as anything we did all season, and it's certainly not the scene that makes you cry, it, but I think the reason he was so proud of that is because it's only about the writing and it's only about the acting, and we're so used to, in television and film, seeing things that are so highly produced. There's either visual effects in them, there's explosions in them, there's all sorts of special effects. All sorts of things go into sustaining an audience's attention. And for us to do a scene on our show that is probably four minutes long, where we, I think where there are three edits in the whole scene, there's, it's not about the cutting, it's only about this performance, these two performances, and this writing. That's extraordinary. And I think that captures something that's at the essence of this show that is so extraordinary, which is people are connected and committed to watching and understanding and relating to these people who are living their lives and trying to be decent people, and to be able to sustain that and, and have it impactful is the thing I think everybody's most proud of. And I think you know, that's a credit to, to Milo and Mandy and to Dan, most of all, is that, wow, you don't need all, any of that stuff. You can just have stuff that's a really extraordinary representation of life. And that that's, can be enough sometimes, you know? So I think that was really he cool. He did say uh, there was the intention months before of Dan said, I'm going to deliver this scene and around this part of the, the at this time of the of the season, and it's going to be a fight between the two of them. That's going to be real and it's going to be long and it's not going to be cut. It's going to be really hard to watch and it's going to. And when Dan once is passionate about something like that, I just get out of the way. I was like, okay. And he said, you're not going to cry when you see it. It's just going to be unsettling and strange and upsetting in all different kinds of ways. And he was right, and you executed it beautifully, and obviously so did you and Mandy. So. And then he has Milo come downstairs at the end of the episode and make you cry by telling her how much he loves her. And you're like, okay. You know. Uh. Uh, Jennifer, you made some news um, earlier um, last month when you announced that This Is Us was going to move to uh, Thursday nights, and then you decided to put it back on Tuesday. Talk to us a little bit about that decision and sort of the ramifications um, that it's had for production. Yeah. I mean, you get some pressure in, you know, at the, you know, we wanted to build another night. We do have a big show that we feel like no matter where we put it, the audience will follow. But the truth is, once Dan came in and kind of laid out to me what he wanted to do with the second season, and you guys probably don't understand or wouldn't because it's boring, but six episodes... Um, Business stuff is actually so exciting. Six <laughs> episodes on Thursday night, we would have hit a wall with uh, the NFL and football on NBC, 
So you, we would be off the air then. For the show would be off the air really for two months because you'd then run into the Christmas holidays and it would be back. So we were looking at six episodes of This Is Us, a two-month break, and then the show coming back. And I think we all had to just look at each other and say, this is not in the best interest of this show. And so we moved it back, and I think we're all thrilled with the decision. And, you know, we have to do what's right for a show that is groundbreaking and incredible in every way, and it would be a disservice to it to not, to not treat it that way. And as a result, that's why Dan isn't here today, correct? <laughs> <laughs> Dan, Dan is, Dan, yeah, yeah, he's he's in the he's back in the writer's room. Dan he's did working. tell me when he's I said you have ten episodes in a row on Tuesday night, and there's no preemptions. It's ten straight, and he like looked at me with like, like a sweat, slight yeah, sweat, yeah. flop sweat, and he, and he kind of gets like this little smile, almost like he he, he almost turns like a little bit of a boy. Like he a was like, boy. I'm gonna do it, Jen. I think I yeah. think I'm gonna do it, Jen. I was like, I think I'm going to. It's not gonna be good enough, and he's like, <laughs> I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna. We're gonna make it happen no matter what, and so. He came up to me last night, like practically shaking, saying that he he couldn't leave the writers' room for two days to fly here to do this. It would jeopardize what he needs to deliver. So I think we'll all be happy when we have ten awesome episodes of the show. Versus, versus Dan being in this room, that's okay. It's okay. Um, Ken, talk to us a little bit about what you learned about pacing and storytelling in season one. Like, um, how did it? How did you go about finding the rhythm, and what type of pacing and storytelling does this show demand that might be different from other shows? Personally, what I learned, I, I, I had spent, um, you know, the last I think ten years of my career I, at doing Alias and Brothers and Sisters is that, is that uh, which were and it more and more accelerated editing pace. You know, the the, the pace of things was so fast. And I think one of the things that um, John and Glenn, as directors established in the pilot, as well as, as Dan's sensibility, is that there are moments that need to be accelerated the, with the cutting, but also there need to be long periods where, there's, um, where things settle and that we take more time. And that's just an interesting thing that's come around, I think. I don't know how rhythms or why rhythms necessarily change, but it seems that th rhythms are changing, that there are things that really need to open up, that need to take time. And that's something that, um, that I, I learned this year. We, you know, there, we have a cast, thank God, we have a cast that comes prepared. They know their lines. They all tend to have a, a, a fairly rapid internal s rhythm so that the dialogue is said quickly, but I think um, more than anything, we learned that where, where do we have to pick up the pace? Where do we need to have uh, a quicker cutting and options like that? And where do we really need to slow down? And that's been an interesting thing to watch is like, wow, we, we actually, we, we can take our time, take a long time between lines or just where things settle, we watch something. You know, there's a scene in the, in the uh, last episode where um, Mandy, uh, and Milo are driving home. And it was written this way, but, but we did it where there's no music playing, there's nothing, they're just sitting in a car, and they're not saying anything, and we, it's just one shot. It's one of those moments that if we didn't take the time, it wouldn't be anywhere near as painful or, or compelling. It's like, oh, sitting in a car, and you, she's so mad at him. And Jack is still kind of drunk. drunk. And he's, and he, yeah, he's drunk, and he, you know he is in so much trouble. And then it he was, says one it, word, she's like, no. And like, yeah. oh. and it's great. That's yeah. that's Dan's sense of rhythm, yeah. you know, and it's, it's fantastic. All right, this is a question for all three of you, Milo. I want to start with you. What has been your favorite fan theory about how Jack died? <laughs> Miguel killed him. <laughs> I mean, I, I enjoyed that one just because it feels so far-fetched and, and, and a bit ridiculous, only because, like, Miguel is Jack's best friend. I mean, I... Some of like my closest friends, like one actually my oldest friend um, that we grew up together. His name's Aaron Steger. He's 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 like my brother. We've known each other since first grade, and he said to me, he said, "Listen, if I ever pass away, like you got to take care of my family." He said, "But you just you, you can't sleep with my wife." And I'm like, <laughs> "Okay." I said, "I understand. Cool. I'll take care of her." He's like, "No, no. Like kids go to college, like like Ivy League and all that, but." You can't sleep with my wife. And I was like, yeah, but I look at your wife like my sister anyhow, so yeah, everyone would be protective and, and taken care of. But 
you know, I, I, I think the idea of, you know, everybody kind of coming down on Miguel, it's like, give the man a chance. Like, let him, like, you know, earn it because he absolutely will. Jennifer, how about you? That one was a good one because we all felt bad for Miguel. He's such an <laughs> incredible actor yeah. and John guy. And he, the character, like, is just people just want to hate, wanted to hate on him so bad. And then yeah. someone said, right, he was a murderer. And it's like, oh, my God, he's not. Um, but I think there was another really funny convoluted one. Somebody came up with some really, like, they had a lot of time. Yeah. And they wrote a whole crazy thing. And like I, a liquor store robbery. Yes. I, there's, like, they had full scenes and intrigue and a new there character came in. There was a plane crash. And, yeah. So they're kind of entertaining, but yeah. uh, none of them none of them have gotten close to what it is. Dan said yeah. the other night, so I can say it too. I didn't even know Jack died. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, okay. um, one the, uh, episode at a time, yeah, yeah. Ken. One episode at a time. Like, wait, what? Uh, I, I don't. I, I don't know. I mean, why, he dies in a car crash. Why would you think that? No. Um, no. Uh, I I don't know. They they all seem. I, I, for me, I'm paying attention to so many other things. I mean, I, I don't know. I, I don't have any favorite. Theories. I think is I'll say this. I think that is great that the audience is engaging in that way where they're they're they want to know the mystery. They want they're excited about it, and at the same time, they 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 know that they may be onto something. They're probably not, and then when it happens, they'll just be like, hopefully, just push, you know, blown away. I think that the truth is, in some ways, it. It was one of those things, it got away from us. It's one of many layers uh, in the story, emotional layers of the story. And it's so funny, like that it, it's, it's like the idea of crying, how it's become this, the, the tissue thing. The, t in, I know that our intention from the beginning was not like, eh, when do we make him cry? <laughs> All right, now, yeah, now you wanna make, now let's make him cry. Now, I mean, it's always for Dan writing from an organic place, a truthful place. And the same thing with his dying was that was, you know, an emotionally resonant thing that, oh, this will inform the way that we, the kids and, but, but it's become this thing, which we obviously need to address and, and <laughs> at some point, no, we will, this soon, I think. You had this obsession building early yeah. on, like, where's Jack? Like, where the hell is he? Like, people were freaking out. And so we started marketing a little bit digitally to, where is he? And it just, the people just cannot, the fans of the show cannot stop thinking about it. Just the other day, Justin and I left an event, and he was walking down the street to go to dinner. He was mobbed with people screaming, like, you have to tell us, like, what happened to Jack? <laughs> I'm sure he loved that. <laughs> Uh, Milo, Justin speaking of the school. fans, what has been your uh, most memorable fan interaction? Again, so many, but, you know, uh, uh, Chrissy and I, we went to Berlin um, when the show was released over there, and we were doing some press and just, like, you know, meeting some folks over there. On, on our way back to go to New York for the big upfront presentation, we were walking off the plane, and there were a couple gals that were asking for photos, and, and that was very sweet, you know, and Chrissy's always so gracious and kind. And then there was one gal that walked up to me and kind of like quietly just said to me, she said, I just wanted to thank you. My husband and I adopted a, a boy and, and my husband had had a really hard time with him. And we watch your show and we see the relationship between father and adopted son. And I just want to thank you, you know, for, for your portrayal <laughs> and this and that. No, seriously. Yeah. Again, I'm trying to keep my shit together, know, okay, man? I'm sorry. <laughs> and 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 then you know and then she like I was like oh god man thank you and then she pulls out the phone and she shows me a photo of her son and her husband and I'm really trying to keep myself together <laughs> I mean but it's and and you know and we introduce ourselves and then she just kind of like she just walks away you know so I, I think the the nicest thing that I've been able to experience is when this show and all its makings has has managed to impact people in their lives and has given them an opportunity to have a conversation to be able to say hey it's okay that this was something that was hurting me I'm, I'm allowed to talk about this now and my life is not so dissimilar from these characters on tv and not so dissimilar from his life or her life or their life or anything like that it's it sparked a a trend i think of coming together and actually trying to relate and move forward as opposed to hold on to whatever's been you know kicking our ass for years are your fan interactions different with this show than they were say with heroes or gilmore girls yes <laughs> how so well i mean look 
Uh, nowadays, it's, hey, when does Jack die? Before, it was like, is it Jess's baby? <laughs> I mean, you know, it's like, for me, for me, I bounce back and forth. And then people were like, what happened to Heroes? And I'm just like, uh... <laughs> Marvel stepped in. Um... It's probably easier to answer, is it Jess's baby? No. <laughs> I know, disappointingly, no. I, I think I literally broke a, a, a young lady's heart the other day. She's like, okay, so I have kind of a random but very important question. <laughs> She'd had a drink or two. <laughs> and, uh, and I go, okay, actually, Lisa was right next to me when, we were, when this happened. And, uh, and I said, okay, what's going on? I said, I hope I, I can answer this for you. And she said, it's just his baby, right? <laughs> and I just go, no. She's like, no, it is. I go, no, it's not. It was really not. And she goes, no, it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, it's the fan. I'm grateful for fan interactions. I, again, I love being a part of something that is inspiring people to, to want to open up dialogue and to even approach me, strangely, because I'm, I'm in their living rooms once a week. So they feel like, you know, it's all good because, hey, you know, I know this guy. We've had dinner with him. He's babysat before. <laughs> so for, for me, it's, 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 it's always an honor when anyone recognizes any of the work. The best part about it, though, is if I'm ever with Jen or I'm ever with Ken, I'm like, but this is the boss. She, she put the show on the network, or this is the man that directed the They're episode. They're like, yeah, 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 yeah. Get out of the way. <laughs> Hardly. No, no, no. I've had, uh, there have been a lot of people that turn, and then they thank you. And that's very generous and untrue. But, but that's also very true. Um, that's very true. They do do Come you're, on. You're awesome. <laughs> um, at the airport uh, today in LAX, we just flew in, he was surrounded by, I want to say, 30 women in white shirts on that were all part it was of a, a bachelorette bridal party, party. A bachelorette party. <laughs> and they he took a picture with all of them and I, I mean this this photo rivaled the the Bradley Cooper Ellen DeGeneres one <laughs> come on and then walking out of the airport people run up my wife's in love with you my wife's in love with you guys taking pictures with I mean it's you know they you're like you're you're like the husband you know you're the dream you're the dream dad and husband. I think, so I think Jack. Loves it. I think Jack, much like every character on this show, has has been able to break through the wish fulfillment experience and make these people feel like you accessible, real, and you know them. You know them. You know. I mean, I guess in a way, I'm not too dissimilar from Jack, but you know, it's 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 just, it's it's humbling and it's exciting. And I know we all can't wait to get back to work to, to tell more stories, so. Jen, success in television often breeds copycats. So have you been reading like a lot of bad This Is Us knockoffs um, that people are pitching you? How, is that, how has that been? You know, a show that executes at this level, I don't know one dares to try to knock it off. It's, it would be embarrassing. <laughs> but I will tell you that um, other networks, right when the show started to really take off, my counterparts at other places were getting calls from the chairman of their company saying, where's our This Is Us? Where's our show that makes you cry? Where, where, what, what's happening? Like, why don't we have a show like this? And, you know, these are magical shows. We've all been doing this a long time. And when somebody says to me, do you have This Is Us this year? It's like, no, I don't. I have other things. But This Is Us is a, shows like that are a, are a once in a lifetime thing. They're, they're the things you look back on in your career that, and in your life, if, you're t if the show touches you in any way, that you'll remember, just like real fans of the show will remember. And they're highlights of your highlight reel of your emotional and professional life. And to me, you know, they, they're not knockoffable. They're not, there's no way to copy them. They come out of someone's soul and experience. And in the case of this show, it was beautifully cast. It was executed, you know, at the top of its game, and it is just an incredible breakthrough piece, and something like you know you can't you can't copy it. It would be embarrassing to try. Not a copy. What would you consider a spinoff? No. What I did do is go to the net. We talked a lot at the network about how do we because we ha you know we we like these shows that feel human first and fundamentally positive. We actually have these kind of cultural you know. Uh, signposts for what we're what we're trying to do there, so this show dovetails perfectly with that, as do others. And 
you know, we just we we started thinking about how do you how do you find a procedural that feels more emotionally grounded? How do you sort of look at other genres of television in a way that create connection and and feeling and emotion like that? And it's not easy. We we've we've made a few things this season that we've picked up actually. I think The Brave is a good patriotic uh, heroic show that has a very emotional sense story at the center of it. So we're 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 looking into that kind of thing. I mean, I think in a world where there's 500 and more shows that people could be watching at any time, if you don't feel something deep watching it, likely it's going to be an empty calorie and that'll be it. But we want we want to create a, a buffet that you come back to again and again. No celery. N no. Kind of a little celery, but... Ken, as you get to know the actors on the show and... Um, as um, as the season progresses, are there any real life tra traits from some of the actors that you find your way making their ways into characters? Is there anything about Milo in particular that influences Jack? Milo in particular, um, <laughs> yeah, Milo's nothing like Jack. Believe me, <laughs> ruthless, um, violent. Um, yeah, I, but I think with with any series. Um, the actors, I mean, when you have actors like this that respect the material and they try to live up to the material, interpret the material, and and as the writers watch that process, there's a there's a uh, the, you know there's a confluence there. So you, the, the voice gets known better. I mean, and, and you learn certain things and and you work towards that. I mean, one of the things Milo and I talked about very early on as as you know, uh, the, uh, as um, the character of Jack really was being developed, was that you know, it's, uh, actors, some actors, they uh, they have a dexterity in one area, not in another. They're try very you know, the glib. Milo is an incredibly centered, really uh, in his stillness, he's extraordinarily interesting, and he. But it's like a you know, I've said this to you and. I'm more in love with Milo than Mandy, and than anybody. I mean, if, I, if he could be the father of my child. Um, but uh, we're, we're going to adopt a baby together. Um, but I, I, he, like the way that the great sort of movie stars and, and the, they, they can capture in stillness, uh, they, they, they can capture your interest, they're compelling. And one of the things that Milo and I started talking about early on was, you know, we have, there's a lot of really, really clever, writing and talk and speak in the show. I mean, and, and one thing Dan is always, you know, working on and is interested in that is edited often is that we can be overwritten. And, and we do that for, for a reason. It's done for a reason. And that we have, you know, the, there are actors that are very, very good with words. And one of the things Milo and I were talking about early on was, you know, it's kind of interesting. Maybe Jack is, is not that, not the same. That there's a real distinction between the way Jack grew up as we as we've seen, and the way that that Mandy's character grew up, and there and there's a different class, there's a different experience. And one of the things we talked about was, I don't think that the character of Jack is a person of words. He doesn't go to words as easily as a way to diffuse whatever he's feeling emotionally. And I think Milo began to work on it. Milo can can carry that. He doesn't have to have the same kind of verbal dexterity as Justin's character. He doesn't, he's not a neurotic character. He doesn't diffuse his emotions with, with words all the time. And that became a very interesting thing. Now Milo's very smart, obviously, and, and, and he's a good talker to when he determined. wants to be. But, but there was an interesting way in which, for Milo specifically, that became more and more an aspect of the writing, is that here's a character who, when things start getting more and more bottled up, when he, it comes out, it comes out physically. And we've seen that a couple of times, which is fascinating. I mean, a couple of times, this guy goes across the room, he'll hit somebody. And that, he, he, he gets bottled up, which is why at the very end of the season, when he stands there, I mean, this personally as a director watching Milo do this scene, and he expresses to Rebecca how much he loves her it's the one time you see him stand there and tears come because it's so hard for him to be still and express himself through words that way. And that's you know specific to Milo, who you know he he's brought that to the work, and it's it's extraordinary. 
I can't let you guys off the stage without um, asking you for a teaser for season two. No. <laughs> that was Mandy in the car. Shut up. <laughs> no talking from you. There's no teasers except, I will say one thing. Season two, because Dan did say this, so I'm going to say it. I would never step out of the box of Dan's sacred creative world. Season two, I think, will be big. I know will be bigger than season one. It's there. There's a lot of things happening. The show isn't going to settle down and get quieter. Li it, it'll maintain all its authenticity and soulfulness. But there's a lot happening, and um, I got to tell you, it's incredible. What do you mean? Well, what do you mean great. by bigger? <laughs> what? Yeah, what do you mean by bigger? Just all good. Just trust me. <laughs> I mean, it's all really, it's fucking exciting. <laughs> what, I, what I know, sorry for, for the profanity, but I mean, it really is, it's, I've been dying to get back to work and even like the little stories and s snippets we always get from Dan and then when he kind of throws out the, I'm just going to stop. When do, you all start fi when do you all start filming again? Soon. July 11th. Excellent. That's well, I just want to say one thing to all the people that are, are fans of the show and everything is, is what you love about the show that is an experience that those of us working on the show share. It, it is, it's the most authentic and warm and appreciative and respectful uh, group of people that I've worked with and I've been doing this for like over five years now. <laughs> now for over 30 something years and I... And I uh, <laughs> You see that plug? You see that plug? 30-something. That was awesome. Yeah, I don't know where you could even get it. But, get, you know, but, uh, <laughs> VHS, but, uh, but right? I, I just want to say I, I think that, and it speaks to what, what this what lady was saying earlier, is, you know, it, it, the way that our country is right now, it's just, it's tough. And I, I think one of the things that the show celebrates and is true of all of the people on the show and the way that they treat each other, the show doesn't shy away from how tough things can be, the, how much people ha struggle at different times to be good, to be better people, to be loving to those they care about, to try to live good lives and be good people. It's really hard. But there is one quality that this show has that somehow comes through and is so unique and I think so special and to be just cherished, and I, I so thank the audience for finding a place for it, and, and that is kindness. I think kindness is something that Dan Fogelman believes in deeply, and I think that it's a real testament to some of the better angels of all of our natures that a show like this can be celebrated at a time like this, and, and these people and all the people that work on the show are the most decent and kind and and gener generous people that I've ever worked with. And that's extraordinary. And, and I so appreciate the audience for taking that in and letting us continue to actually make a show that celebrates a quality like that. So thank you. That is a wonderful, wonderful note to end on. Let's have a round of applause for our terrific, terrific panel. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate y'all. Thank you.